On the last slide, we learned how Bitcoin mining works. And so the mental model you should have in mind is you have all these different miners and they're constantly trying these different nonces, uh, trying to construct a block which is eligible in the sense that uh, when you apply a cryptographic hash function to it, SHA-256, uh, you get uh, a bunch of zeros in a row, say roughly 80 zeros in a row at the beginning. And so miners just keep trying nonces over and over and over again until eventually somebody gets lucky, has an eligible block, and that's what gets added to the blockchain. Uh, we also saw, you know, where does that number 80 come from? That's calibrated as a function of the sort of current amount of computational power that miners collectively have. Uh, and that's automatically tuned so that you expect to see a new block uh, roughly every 10 minutes on average. Now it's random, right? Sometimes it'll be more than 10 minutes and sometimes it'll be less than 10 minutes. Um, and in fact, you know, sometimes it'll just so happen that two different miners uh, wind up coming up with an eligible block and possibly different eligible blocks, possibly blocks containing, say, different sets of transactions, uh, two different miners will basically have a tie. So they'll each come up with a, a, an eligible block, you know, just a few seconds apart, um, which means that they'll both broadcast it out to the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, and then miners will hear about these two conflicting blocks. So that's something that is known as a fork. So, for example, imagine the end of the block blockchain concludes with, you know, say there's a block B1 and then there's a block B2 at the very end of the blockchain. Uh, and maybe two different miners come up with different eligible blocks, a B3 and a B4, that come up with them at roughly the same time. Uh, and so both of those miners then put in their block, they reference the, the previous block that they both knew about, uh, B2. This is a problem, right? This is now there's ambiguity in the blockchain. Uh, it's not clear what the end of the blockchain is now. It's not clear whether it's B3 or whether it's B4. Um, it's not clear which of these transactions should be viewed as authorized, you know, whether we view B3 as authorized or B4 as authorized. Notice, you know, it's a good chance that we can't just authorize everything in B3 and B4 because uh, there might be conflicting transactions. So, for example, coins might get spent one way in B3, and those same coins might get spent a different way in B4. Um, so that would be an, incompat an incompatibility that really forces us to choose only one of B3 or B4 uh, as the transactions to be authorized. And then, of course, another reason we have to resolve this ambiguity is because later miners need to figure out, you know, what they should be extending. So if I'm a miner and I'm trying to come up with a new eligible block B5, remember part of my block, I have to reference a previous block, and there's ambiguity about whether I should be referencing block B3 uh, or B4. So when there's a fork like this, two different blocks that point to the same preceding block, uh, the protocol needs to specify a way to break this tie, to figure out you know, which one you should regard as the correct um, extension, the correct blockchain. Satoshi Nakamoto anticipated that there would be forks, and uh, it's written in the Bitcoin protocol how you're supposed to deal with them, uh, namely that you're supposed to regard the longest chain of blocks as the valid transactions, as the authorized transactions. Now, if there's a tie, you know, like we have at the moment in this figure, uh, then you're supposed to break ties according to whichever block you heard about first. So if you heard about B3 over the peer-to-peer -peer network before B4, um, you, would, you as a miner would then try to extend B3. Totally possible that some other miner heard about B4 before B3, and then that miner uh, would be trying to extend B4. So that means there is um, temporarily still ambiguity about where the end of the blockchain is. Uh, some miners are trying to extend B3, some miners are trying to extend B4, depending on which one they heard about first. Uh, but at some point, some miner will succeed in finding an eligible block, some B5, and that particular miner will have made a choice whether to extend B3 or B4. Um, in the picture, let's say that they choose to extend B3. Um, and then once that extension happens, the ambiguity is resolved. Because now there's a unique longest chain, and all miners know that they should now be trying to extend block B5. It is, of course, possible that one miner finds a block B5 extending B3 at roughly the same time that some other miner finds a block B6 extending B4, which would, per which would uh, per um, perpetuate the tie. Uh, you know, but that's pretty unlikely, right? So very quickly, you know, some miner will find a block extending one of the uh, two equally long chains, uh, well separated from anyone else finding any blocks. Uh, and at that point, the tie is broken, the ambiguity is resolved, and all of the miners uh, are supposed to just try to extend the longest chain. 
One thing to notice is that when a fork gets resolved in this way, so for example, if a minor extends B3 before any minor extends B4, uh, it's definitely a bummer for um, anyone with an investment in block B4. Because, uh, you know, once, this, once B3 is extended by B5 and B4 is no longer on the longest chain, at that point, B4 is what is called orphaned. And so, in fact, all, none of those transactions count. None of those transactions count as authorized. Um, of course, they can be authorized later in another block, or maybe some of them are already authorized in, in B5. Um, but uh, in addition, the creator of the block does not reap any of the rewards that we discussed. Uh, so it doesn't get the transaction fees from these transactions because the transactions aren't actually authorized. And it also does not get that 6.25 Bitcoins. It doesn't get the block reward either because the block wound up not on the longest chain. Now, one actually, one little difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is the uh, sort of second most well-known uh, blockchain, is that block uh, Ethereum actually does give some rewards for uh, orphans, um, but in Bitcoin, you don't. So if your block is orphaned, you get nothing. No reward for all of the work you put in uh, to putting it together. If you think about it, you know, this way that Bitcoin works, where you have these forks sort of show up and then they get resolved and blocks get orphaned and the transactions in orphan blocks don't count, that does have implications for how you should use Bitcoin, right? So suppose, you know, you're selling something, maybe even something expensive, right? You're selling like a car to somebody uh, and they're paying you with a Bitcoin uh, transaction, right? So they say, okay, look, here's the Bitcoin transaction. You know, there it is in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Oh, look, you know, it got added to the blockchain. It's in some block, you know, like block B4. Uh, so we're good. You've received the payment. Now you can ship me the car. Um, well, actually, uh, if you're the seller, you don't want to ship the car the very second um, that the Bitcoin transaction gets added to the blockchain. Because if that transaction, you know, is in one of these blocks before that then winds up getting orphaned, uh, well, then all of a sudden you've shipped the car and the transfer of funds uh, from your customer to you is no longer valid. And so, you know, it could be the case that uh, the customer gets both the car and gets to keep all of their Bitcoin. So that would not be a good thing. So, you know, the, so what one does is one waits. Uh, so a transaction is considered sort of, you know, safe. The funds are considered safely transferred once the transaction is not only added to the blockchain as part of an eligible block, but also after some number of additional blocks have been added on top of that. So, for example, a transaction in B3 uh, in this cartoon, if you're feeling very kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, aggressive about it, uh, you could say, oh, well, as soon as B5 is on it and B3 is definitely on the longest chain, you know, at that point, I'll regard the transaction as finalized and I definitely have those funds. Um, a more conservative approach would be to wait not just for B5, but also wait for B6 to extend B5 and then a B7 to extend B6 and so on. And in fact, the usual recommendation is to regard a transfer as, you know, more or less finalized once it's been extended by six additional blocks. All right, so that's going to take roughly an hour because uh, remember, blocks are created on average once every 10 minutes. Um, so there's going to be some moment where the transaction gets added to the blockchain, and then assuming there's no funny stuff with forks and orphans, uh, an hour later, it'll be clearly kind of deep into the longest chain. And at that point, uh, you can safely assume that, uh, that the funds, you know, are permanently transferred to you. The point of this slide is that even when all of the miners are following the rules, even when everybody's executing the Bitcoin protocol exactly the way they're intended to be executing it, uh, you will just by chance have these forks and you have to deal with forks and then Bitcoin has this longest chain rule for figuring out how to resolve forks. Um, and so that's even assuming that all mon miners are being honest, namely they're really sort of uh, following the intended behavior prescribed by the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, but what we're going to see on the next slide is actually there's also potentially opportunities for miners to gain the system. So to deviate from what they're supposed to be doing and to create forks on purpose uh, for their own individual gain. So we'll talk about that next.